Hey everybody, this is Shane, and I'm back with my podcast, The Passion Designer, the first episode of my podcast, and I'm really stoked today for who I have right here. So this is The Passion Designer, a podcast about passion projects and what drives them. Like I said, my name is Shane. If we've not met before, nice to meet you. But today, I have a very, 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 very special guest, and this special guest we have decided to come full circle. I've been featured on his podcast many a times. Many a times. I think it's three to be exact. Mr. Raul Alejandro Mendoza. Or the what's Nerdy up, what's Chicano. Up, what's, up, what's, up, what's, up? what's up, Big Connect? <laughs> Dude, I can't believe you. How are you, man? How are you doing? I'm doing good, bro. I'm doing good. Yeah. I'm I even had you host an episode once, you remember? Yes, that was that was an incredible time because I actually didn't really know what I was doing or what I was getting myself into, but I do appreciate that. It did help. Now, like I said, I've taken a podcast in class before, so it's not my first rodeo, but I feel like I'm starting over again. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, no, yeah. so before we begin, Raul, I just want you to plug your social media and where people can find you. I make it really easy for you guys at at the nerdy Chicano on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I don't I don't uh, please don't add me on Facebook if we've never had a prior conversation before. That's just my my uh, my go to's are Twitter and Instagram at the nerdy Chicano. Go and follow that for uh, terrible posts and terrible tweets. Good. I'm glad we got that established. And and my next question is and i'm going to tell the people this and this is because this is important so podcasting is actually not really your passion project you do it for fun right <laughs> yep so we won't really talk about uh the nerd core we'll talk we'll touch on it a little bit but i'd rather have you and brad back on a separate episode to talk about that because you guys together are an unstoppable force a one-two punch if you will of yeah definitely a cast of characters might I add maybe have <laughs> maybe have everybody else on there who does your shows as well i'd love to talk to them and get their thoughts on uh the whole podcasting thing if they mm -hmm. definitely enjoy it yeah yeah um you could definitely get ashley on she's a she used to be in a band and now she's doing a soundcloud rap so you know she does that and she also hosts like two shows on the feed but yeah, I know. I'd love to be back with Brad, dude. Brad and I, we can detail a lot, even the journey just to make this, you know, because Brad's not the first one. Brad's not the person who made the podcast for me. You know, it was Luis. But Brad took over and basically, you know, raised. He, Brad's the stepdad who raised the kid when Luis <laughs> ran out on the kid. I love oh, you, Luis. Oh, man. <laughs> I love you, Luis. That's his own analogy, okay? So don't. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> okay, so why don't you tell the people out there what your real passion project is? All right. Well, my name is Raul Alejandro Mendoza Diaz, and I am a visually impaired Chicano filmmaker from Bronzeville, Texas. I am currently a film student at the University of Houston studying media production with a minor in Mexican-American study. I, um, I have four... Well, three, four, number four is currently being edited. Three short films under my belt that I sent to Shane. And my passion is filmmaking, man. Uh, I am a director, writer, and cinematographer. Uh, that's all the, the areas that I cover. And yeah, I make movies and I love making movies. Man. So the first thing I found interesting, uh, you did send me your catalog. Mm -hmm. And I definitely watched all of them and I definitely enjoyed them. So actually, mm -hmm. I've made very similar projects to you, believe it or not. I did have a mm -hmm. class in uh, at Lewis University that was advanced post-production, and it was actually taught by a gentleman known as uh, John Kilpatrick. He's actually a editor for, um, he was an editor, excuse me, for the Oprah show. He actually has four or five Emmys. Damn. He's an incredible uh, teacher. He, I definitely learned a lot from him. Um, just picking up on things like that. So what's your favorite part about filmmaking in general? So like, what is your favorite spot to be at 
like when a film goes down. You know what I mean? Like, what's your favorite like director? You know, you know, writer, yeah. or you want to be the editor? What do you, What do you want to do exactly? I honestly, man, I love directing so much, but my favorite part is definitely a mix of pre production and production. Uh, production because I'm able to you know finally you know put my vision into place, but Pre-production is so much fun because I'm writing and I'm also visualizing every shot that I want to do and basically getting, I'm basically putting the cake into the oven, but not turning on the, the oven yet. You know, I'm, right, I'm barely yeah. about to I'm pre, I'm preheating the oven, man. Dude, honestly, that, that sounds incredible. So yeah. I've actually made short films and it's not easy. It's mm -hmm. definitely something that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, especially when it comes to uh, writing the whole thing, producing, mm -hmm. directing, shooting it, mm -hmm. making sure it's right and having to go back and shoot it again if it's wrong. Uh, how many times have you had to do that? Um, thankfully, I haven't had to reshoot a lot of things. But I did change things on set for certain uh, for certain films that I did. Which is typical. You know, you never go into doing the same thing that you envision because things change. So mm -hmm. and it's, it's it could be the said the same with any passion project. You know, me being a graphic designer, I have to be ready for when clients don't even like the work I put out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, obviously oh. with you, it's a little bit different because you're making this for your own. You know, mm -hmm. it's your own project. So, but yeah. when you, when you go further on and you start, people start asking you to make commercials or whatever, if you want to do that, you know, obviously you got to make it in the image that they want. You know, your client is super yeah. important. I actually lied, man. I'm sorry. I, I actually reshot the first part, the first part of, uh, the first half of killing you. The last one I did, uh, it's based on the play by Joseph Arnon. Uh, we, I, I, I did the first part in my actual dorm room and I just didn't like the feel for that. So then I brought back the cast and air and the, and the, and the crew for the, for the next day. And we did it inside the trash, the trash room of the, of my dorm in college. Right. It seemed, and it I, seemed very familiar when I watched it. Like, cause <laughs> I, I know what, I know what dorms, you know, look like, especially like, mm -hmm. um, you know, going to going to school even though i didn't live on campus because mm -hmm. the school was literally right down the street from my house there's no reason to pay the extra twenty thousand, mm -hmm. whatever it is a year to live there to eat shitty food and literally not come home for a long yeah. time um i'm definitely would have probably learned a lot but at the same time you know college campuses make for great sets oh there's yeah. a lot of there's a lot of stuff that we've had to do especially uh with my electronic media production minor, which is basically, you know, basically filmmaking, if, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. but more of like a corporate setting. Um, there's mm -hmm. definitely a lot of sets um, as far as that goes. But mm -hmm. how how often do you find yourself out there filming? So I usually have at least one project to do in my classes. But now since I'm taking a, a heavier workload, I'm starting to, I'm probably going to have more projects to do, but when I come back home for the summer, I have myself do two projects. So this, this, this summer I did, uh, beyond the river. And then this week then we get started on my second documentary. Borderline. Okay. So, um, before we get into your, your, your work and, you know, kind of probing that, um, uh, one thing I want to go back to is the, the beginning of what, uh, Mr. Raul Alejandro Mendoza is. And when did you start actually uh, trying to become a filmmaker? Well, um, we did a, we did a discussion about this uh, yesterday with, uh, with Brad for the podcast. And I actually can't give you the most detailed answer to that. I actually have to go back to when I was a young kid watching uh, Bambi, the Lion King and Dumbo. And I think that's where my curiosity for art really happened. And I, and I always tell uh, people that the reason why I like film so much is because of the emotion it can invoke in you. Like you have a child who has no idea what death is and you have no idea, they have no grasp about the concept of death. But when they see Bambi's mom get, mom get shot in the movie, they feel a sadness for that. And that's right. It's like a, it's like a yeah. visual reaction. Yeah. Um, you may and you may not crazy. understand yeah. everything, but it's still cognitive. It's still kind of 
um, mm-hmm. upsetting that she's mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. moving. You know, she got yeah. shot, you know, and it's very sad. But yeah. I definitely understand where that comes from. Now, uh, as far as like all of my passion project goes, you know, they don't really they're, they're kind of like the same thing. They don't really stem from anything. There's no real con- concise answer. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's just something that I, I caught on to and then I mm-hmm. that I did. Yeah. But well, I can definitely just, understand um where where that love comes from because those are definitely some great movies that you just mentioned. Especially growing yeah. up, you you watch movies all the time, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, those three were the big ones when I was a kid, and then when I became a teenager and films like um like Amores Perros, uh, Interstellar and uh the other one was um what's it called inception you know those really stood out to me when i was a teen and uh yeah i i have always loved movies since i was a kid but i made the decision in the summer no not summer i'm sorry uh, the spring of 2016 uh you know all of 2015 my first semester in 2016 i had been spending with a really really bad depressive episodes and because i wasn't doing what i was loving at my university i was a chemical engineer major and then I said, you know what? Dude, you were I really make- going for it, man, weren't you? You yeah. were looking at that paycheck. Yeah, I really <laughs> Dude, was, don't man. worry, don't worry. I think I think everybody does that. I think like when you when you go to school and you see the price tag of it, you're like, oh shit, like I gotta do something good. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise I'm gonna be sad because I'm broke. But hopefully, yeah. hopefully these these presidential candidates that are coming out now saying they about to about to forgive some student loans. We've got to feel really good if I, uh, if that's the case, I'm about to feel really good, but, but no, I was in the same boat too. And like, I definitely was going to be like an engineer, like a biomedical mm-hmm. engineer. That sounds boring as hell. Now that I like yeah. look back on it, I'm just like, dude, like, I can't believe like I almost talked myself into doing something like, yeah. That I didn't yeah. even know what I was going to do. Like, I didn't even know what it was. I was just like, all right, cool. Like, I like biology. I like medicine's mm-hmm. cool. Like, I like helping people. Like, yeah, I'm going to be a fucking bigwig at a biomedical at engineer, all. like yeah. a hospital or some shit. Like, yeah. And I wasn't bad per se. I did. Like, you know, anybody, you know, changes their major, like, oh, you couldn't handle it, right? You're like, bad at math and science it's, I'm like, it's never no, not handling it yeah people yeah, people so find the bad. worst thing to like to cut you down when you actually want to do something you want to do and it's not mm-hmm. even like being a hater it's just like their natural reaction maybe it's because like that's how they were taught to react to sort of things like if it never gets mm-hmm. completed that way it's like oh well he just you know couldn't do it or whatever which is i think it's stupid in my opinion like your, oh, all all your roads that you go down, like, um, you know, being happy and, you know, being that in that depressive state all depends on like what you do. Like it's, it's all on you. Like things happen, like the universe is like going to work whatever way it wants to work, but you just got to find some way to do it. And, you know, going to school mm-hmm. and actually getting an education and what you want to do is super important, you know, cause there's some people that are happy now cause they got money. And they're pay- they paid off their student loans in one year because they got a good job. But there's also mm-hmm. people later down the line when you're 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 old and you haven't really amounted to anything. You don't think, and you kind of regret your decision. Yeah, yeah. I rather be debt. I rather be debt ridden, and you know, with so much debt and pa- than debt free and miserable, man. And uh, yeah, so that spring of 2016, I decided I after watching. A film called uh, Django Unchained from Quentin Tarantino. Yep. That that movie is not even my favorite movie of all time. It's not even doesn't even touch my my top ten. It's, it's just movie, the though. movie that opened my eyes. Yeah. And you know, my friend was actually studying filmmaking as well, and he's and I said, you know what, I like making videos because around that time I was contemplating, you know, starting a YouTube channel. And you, I said, you know what, I'm gonna go and change my major. I really like movies. And I had always thought about movies in a different light. You know, I didn't watch movies because they're fun. I watch movies to, you know, get some sort of insight from them. And I, and I, and I you know, I really, really liked that aspect of filmmaking. And then, you know, it, it happened from there. I changed my major and I started making YouTube videos, which they're all taken down. I, I, you know, I learned to not like them. 
because it's just that that's not my style. My style is more like, you know, an actual film than a YouTube video. And since then, I've been studying this awesome but stressful major. Right. Yeah, I was going to ask you, I'm, I was very curious to to kind of understand your, your process behind like a YouTube video and why you don't really upload as much. You see a lot of people that, you know, and like it's definitely a stylistic change. It's completely mm -hmm. different. It's not the same thing. Uh, like mm -hmm. to some people and then some people make videos that look like movies and i don't know yeah. how they do it but it's crazy to yeah me. um you know like casey neistat everything he makes is like a fucking movie if you like it's not yeah. it's not really a video i'm watching like but yeah uh to go to go off of that I, me being like a youtuber subpar by the way uh <laughs> I was I was always wondering like man how come he doesn't upload anything like why why does he why does he not make you know content maybe on a weekly basis on something you know obviously aside from the podcast because the podcast I mean makes sense that is weekly mm -hmm. content so you're definitely making it up there daily, you know, and getting bro. getting people interested in what you're doing so mm -hmm. it's daily yeah so yeah. Uh, obviously you just answered my question on why you don't like it um yeah so what what type of videos were you actually making before i was making vlogs man oh like and vlogs. I was, you know, yeah vlogging and then i did you know review movie reviews collection updates uh you know typical I'm, I'm a big collector i'm a big collector you know vinyl movies uh funko pop figures uh action figures oh, so you was you was all over that nerd the nerd youtube the collector yeah. youtube yeah. yeah the first movie review i ever did was the doctor strange movie review uh way back in 2016 but let's i'm gonna be honest with you shane if i were making content right now it'd be the same content i'm putting up on on, on podcast which is just it seems to me it's just so much easier for me and right. i just don't like being in front of a camera that, okay, that makes sense. That's definitely yeah. Yeah, it's hard. It's not. It's not yeah. exactly easy, you know. Especially on the mm -hmm. internet, because people are very savage. Uh, mm -hmm. They definitely do not hold back on yeah. Literally anything that crosses their mind, even how like stupid it sounds, they're gonna yeah. go ahead and do it. So, so the content that you make on a daily basis is the podcasting thing, mm -hmm. but obviously you. Uh, from me being on the show, on the other show, the Gamer Core, uh, mm -hmm. you have a couple different shows on there, and the Nerd Core is one of them. And you talk a lot about movies with Brad. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that being your daily content, how do you come up with uh, what movie to review, or what what do you think is is quality content to like hold over people who definitely are interested in your uh, your filmmaking? I've noticed that, you know, I mean, our episodes do really well, you know, but I've noticed that people really like the news. So we do on Monday, we do the news, which will have stories that we're running and also the box office of the weekend. So we talk about, you know, what went down in the box office and we'll talk about what's going to happen next weekend. What we think will happen. Tuesdays are for our, our themed reviews. So every month, every month, Brad and I choose a theme to do for the month and we'll choose four films or well, two. Um, we choose two movies each and we'll do a coin toss to see who goes first. Uh, this month we're doing uh, movies from Quentin Tarantino and Wednesdays we'll do a discussion. If there, if there's no interview lined up for that, then we're just going to do a discussion on a story that happened during the week that needed to get more coverage than it didn't. And then on Saturday's episode, We'll have the review for the week, which is like if a big movie came out at the theaters and Brad and I got our chance to watch it, that's when it'll go up. So like this Saturday, you're going to get to listen to the Spider-Man Far From Home review. Uh, but, you know, if there's no movie that came out during the week, then Brad and I will just choose something on um, on Netflix or something Hulu in the or, back catalog know. that's like mm -hmm. been waiting yeah. to be reviewed by you. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. That's kind of like, like what I, I do during mm -hmm. streaming. I just like if there's something out, then I'll play it. If I'm definitely yeah. interested in it. If not, we're yeah. going to hit the back catalog because I cannot mm -hmm. finish a game to save my life. Yeah. Uh, so. We've done, mm -hmm, we've done like themes. We've done usually directors, but we have done some more niche themes. Like we did a foreign film month because I'm a huge fan of foreign film. I like them more than American films, actually. 
Yeah, and you you talk prepared. about that a lot, especially um, mm-hmm. referencing the impaired files because it's definitely a show that I draw influence from me being mm-hmm. who I am and, you know, interviewing people who are definitely important to me in my life and mm-hmm. talking about things that they don't normally get to talk about to the people because they're, mm-hmm. they're busy working on it. You know, that's what they do. Um, yeah. So I, I definitely heard that a lot when you talked about sexuality in film yeah. and how taboo it is. And I, I'm sitting in the car because that's when I usually listen to it or when I'm driving thrift to thrift. And I'm just thinking mm-hmm. about it and I'm like, dude, I remember being a kid and just sitting there and like they start fucking kissing on the thing. And I'm like, bro, you know, <laughs> you're in a room with your, with your mom and dad. They yeah, start yeah. kissing sometimes. You're like, bro, what is going on here? You know, but yeah. as you get older, it's like, it's like, dude, just just have a full on fuck in the film, dude. I don't even care. I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah, I'm fucking yeah. ready. Have some hot, dirty sex right now. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, it's it, it is. It always surprises me how taboo the sexuality is in, uh, in movies. And, you know, what's it called? People when I when I always talked about loving Game of Thrones, we were like, dude, how could you like that? Like, there's like so much sex going on in there. It's not even like dude and bolt girl. It's girl and girl or dude and dude. And I'm like, dude, I just I don't care. Like, love I'm is watching. love, baby. It's sex just, is it's sex. Just, it's a normal, it don't matter. It's a very normal thing. It's yeah. like it's a normal thing to have sex. Everybody has sex. Dude, you know, sex is sex, man. Dude. It don't matter who's yeah. doing it. Yeah. It don't yeah, bother it me. Matter. You know, it's still it's still intimate. Like it is it's crazy yeah. how how people think that, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. just going back to what I was trying to reference is that fuck, I forgot. I think Dude. you were saying how like, you know, foreign films really put Oh that yeah, more oh so you were talking about the movie. niche of like what what you do every month to month. Um mm-hmm. can I can I make a suggestion? Sure. I definitely, um, definitely would love to see uh, a, a, like a couple episodes on this just to see your opinion. Because you know me, I don't really watch movies like that. I although although I have seen a couple this year, I've seen a Ooh, lot more yeah. than I have usually. And I just saw um, Toy Story four, of course. Ooh, me being a nineties child, um, yeah. it's very it's very good. Uh, in my opinion. I like it more than Toy Story 3. Damn. Um, yeah. And Toy Story 3 was pretty good. Toy Story mm-hmm. 1 is obviously the best one because it's the OG. Mm-hmm. Can't go wrong with the OG. No. Nah, so, t- so one thing that I've been trying to do is like go to other facets of media and kind of be inspired by that and kind of bring that to what I'm doing elsewhere. You know what I mean? Because I never really got into movies like that. Um, Mm -hmm. so that's, that's one of the things that I've been trying to do, especially, you know, being on your podcast and talking to you guys a little bit more. Cause you know, I've been trying to reach out and network with a lot more people now that Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm just trying to make time for all that sort of stuff and, you know, getting to be able to be on that show and just talk about how I feel about it. But one thing that I want to see you guys do is there's a ton of movies out there that kind of fit this genre that I actually, actually really enjoy. Um, I would like to see you do a month on action films. So Ooh, action, like yeah. sport, like action sports, excuse me, not action films, but action sports. So oh, yeah, Lords films, of Dogtown. films about skateboarding, films about yeah. snowboarding, films about stuff like that. So like um, things like kids, kids is a, is a movie that is like, uh, it, when it came out in the 90s, it was very uh, people were very mm-hmm. skeptical about it. It's a movie that mm-hmm. had a lot of like underage sex and a lot of underage drug usage, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But at its core, it was a skateboarding film. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, mid 90s mm-hmm. just recently came out, which we still have to do our review on that. You know, mm-hmm. I still need to watch it, dude. It's on Prime, man. It's on there. Go watch it. What are you waiting I, I know. for? It's just like, we haven't scheduled for you for like a date. So usually what I'm watching are stuff I need to talk about on the podcast. And if I'm not doing that, then it's like a movie that I really want to revisit. So, you know, when we get you scheduled, I'm going to watch that movie. But we just need to book you for a certain day so that way I can actually do this without, okay. you know. Yeah, no, I, I understand. I guess that makes sense. 
But yeah, yeah no, I, I, you got to watch it. It's definitely, it's definitely a, a very good film, in my opinion, because I, I mean, mm-hmm. I love skateboard culture. We, we, we know this. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I'm a jacker more than anything, only because I still can't skateboard. Uh, it's in mm-hmm. my trunk now. I moved the skateboard to my trunk so I could practice more. So when I'm out and about, sometimes I'll just pull out the skateboard. And I'll just start start trying to ride it, or I fall on my ass. Whatever comes first, you know. Like I said, we get, we got tons of passions on the passion designer. That's why I mm-hmm. called it that. And I mean, you are a testament to that because you're a great filmmaker. I've seen a lot of things mm-hmm. I really love about your films, uh, the ones Thank that you. I've seen at least. And like I said, I've done very similar films as well. So we'll definitely go into that. So that's that's all I really have about your content side because I was I was very curious about that, that there's no other real content on that YouTube page. And I was like, mm-hmm. I was like, I feel like he could definitely like vlog it up. He could definitely do yeah. some do some stuff like yeah. that. Um, so as far as uh, what equipment you have, what what do you usually use? All right, yeah, I have a uh, um, well, I kind of just fucked up my tripod, so you know, I had to, you know, I had to replace that. I have a uh, Canon T six I, and I have the eighteen to fifty five millimeter lens that comes with it. So, the but I also kit? have a yeah, I also have the fifty millimeter uh, f over one point eight. Gotta have it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, f over one point eight uh, millimeter, uh, f over one point eight two. Uh, standard millimeter lens and I also um, what's it called a road video might go so I could be making content and honestly man if I were to be making content it'd be about photography because that's another hobby of mine but you know I uh, that's kind of it for like camera stuff uh, I also have a film camera I have a Practica LTL3 with a 50 millimeter lens and 13 to 128 millimeter lens uh, from uh, from it. So the practice goes from like the communist side of Germany and oh, okay. they stopped making those cameras. So yeah, I, I, I kind of fuck with film sometimes too, film stock. So I have that camera for that, but I am trying to get a new lens because I, I really want to start experimenting more and, you know, get some more new stuff. Yeah. But I had to, mm-hmm. I, I honestly thought about getting one of those, uh, those '90s skateboarding handy cams, like the uh, Panasonic, the one yeah. that takes the the VHS tape. I thought yeah. about I thought about getting one of those because honestly, <laughs> like maybe even seeing a film like shot in VHS, mm-hmm. it, you know, it'd be obviously it'd be like a process to like edit, and it's expensive now. Um, yeah, but it's not expensive to transfer. You know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. and a lot of people have started using it. And one example. Um, it's not really, he's not really like a, a director, but Cole Bennett from, uh, Lyrical Lemonade. He's like a music video director. Uh, mm-hmm. sometimes he can be seen using that in some of his music videos that he makes. And I thought that was very interesting that he, obviously he can afford one cause he's probably making tons of money making those music videos. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, no, I, I thought it was cool that he actually did that throwback work with that on there. Yeah, it's one of my it's one of my favorite things he's probably done uh, using the old camera and and doing that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's interesting. Yeah. A- Aiden and I are always talking about how it's their dream to use uh, film stock when we do when we get to that point, because uh, I'm such a lover of old. I'm such a lover of classic cinema. So I love the grainy feel of film stock. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I my camera is 35 millimeter camera. So I'm I'm trying to do my best to do uh, to do film film photos and you know we're always talking about how that's really the dream for me it's to make a film with on film stock I think it's something that I want to do once and then that's it because it is kind of a really expensive thing and it would be a lot of money to do that but yeah it it that, that just comes from me being such a fan of old film and especially that grainy black and white look to it yeah. So now I want to get into talking about your films because that's what we're here to do. So you have three films currently out available that you people in the audience can watch at this current time if you get the link. Um, (laughs) But um, I had I had watched them before because I like doing my research and making sure that Mm -hmm. I am thorough with my questions so the three films available, and let me know if I have this right. 
Uh, the first one is Immortal, which you uh, shot and directed? Mm-hmm. And uh, co-wrote. Co-wrote it. Okay. And that came mm-hmm. out in 2016, correct? Mm-hmm. Then you have Bloodline, which is a uh, documentary about your family, correct? Mm-hmm. Did that come out in 2018? Yes. I think it might be 2017. I don't remember too well. Okay, so uh, somewhere, somewhere, somewhere behind there, and then your latest one, "Killing You," which is based off of that play you mentioned earlier, which also yeah, is that one in twenty eighteen. That's twenty eighteen, bro. Yeah. So your next one that's on the way is you've been kind of doing some promotion about it. Have you have you started filming it for it yet? The we just wrapped last week. Okay, so you're you're done filming it. We're done filming it. Okay, yeah. so that title is called beyond the river so mm-hmm. when can we expect to see that one last week of june or i mean sorry not june july or the first week of august okay so you're you're putting this out instantly pretty much yeah like I just, hard at work mm-hmm. i'm giving the footage this sunday to my editor and then he's gonna work on that and he okay. said it shouldn't take too long yeah. okay so you're you're not you you shot and wrote this correct you also directed it I directed it, I shot it, and I wrote it, and I produced it with my brother, Luis Fernando Reyes Diaz, and Alex. Cool. That sounds yeah. that sounds like an interesting little, little tidbit there. But one thing I want to talk about is what, what movies or films that are out there inspire you in your work? Oh, yeah. Uh, definitely films from Alejandro González Iñárritu. Uh, Guillermo del Toro, Alfonso Cuaron, and then if I look further, you know, back in time, uh, films from Francois Truffaut, Jean Luc Godard, Federico Fellini, Pier Paolo Pasolini, uh, Roberto Rossellini, and uh, you know, Alfred Hitchcock, Stanley Kubrick, uh, Martin Scorsese. A lot, like you know, I'm I, I'm kind of all over the place with my film. With my film uh, influence, there's definitely some oh. interesting ones in there that I have actually never heard of because they're probably, yeah. I, I I'm assuming they do name, uh, mm-hmm. Latino films, correct? Some of them. Are the very, first three names were the first. Well, Guillermo, the first three names Guillermo del Toro, I do know because he did The Shape yeah. of Water and he's doing the mm-hmm. uh, scary stories to tell in the dark yeah. film that is coming out. And yeah. he's done. He's got an amazing back catalog. He's an amazing director. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Inarito did uh, the Revenant, Birdman, uh, what's it called, Babel, and uh, Alfonso Cuarón just did last year's Roma, which won the foreign language film uh, Oscar. He also did Children of Men, Gravity, and uh, the other ones are old filmmakers. You know, you guys, you guys know who Scorsese is. I mean, he's done, you know, right, yeah, potential, yeah, all that. So uh, I'm very much influenced by Italian neorealism and French new wave. So those are like old from the 60s. So basically Italian neorealism was basically they took actors, non-professional actors from the street or they shot on location, like without a set. They just shot on the streets. And those are the movies that kind of really, um, what's it called, uh, influenced me. And in French New Wave Cinema, they just introduced various techniques. Like the tracking shot was very much a product of, uh, of French New Wave. And also things like holding on to the shot and getting as much emotion from it is a very much a French technique from that from that era. Those I'm, are all my influences. I'm I'm very very interested, definitely, because there's definitely a lot of this, and you can definitely see it, you know, going back. And because I actually don't know what those genres are, I've actually never heard yeah. of them. Um, I yeah. have taken I have taken uh, a film class as far as. Um, uh, plot only it's not about uh mm-hmm. shots or anything like that we didn't mm-hmm. actually have anything like that in our uh at our university because they don't really do film uh they actually just started uh doing film but they did more of plot and adaptation and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that like what's cut out what's in what's not mm-hmm. but you can definitely see that um both of those uh genres that you mentioned in your films Especially, you know, Immortal and, and I mean, Bloodline's a little bit of a different story because it's got a different story, but it does have those elements mm-hmm. in there. And, you know, even Killing mm-hmm. You is a very, very reminiscent of that. That tracking shot is super important. 
um, yeah. trying to follow Mr. Killer into his mm -hmm. lair. You know what I mean? So it's very, it's very important. Um, so another, another thing that I want to talk about is um, writing, because that seems to be a very important part of what you do, like creating content. And is there any like particular writers, you know, they don't have to be like, you know, writers of film, but writers that you, you draw influence from, do you do a lot of poetry or anything like yeah. that? Um, I, Jorge Luis Borges, um, and, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, you know, Gar Garcia Marquez because of his fantastical elements and magic realism. And, uh, what's it called? Borges because of his poetry is just so amazing. But I mean, writers in film, I, I, you know, Hitchcock and, and Kubrick were some of my favorites as well. And, uh, what's it called? Even in Yaritu, his writing is well done, but you know, Josef Arriaga, Guillermo Arriaga, who does an amazing screenplay for his three films, first three films of Inaritu. But, uh, I, I love reading. I love uh, poetry and I love uh, novels and you know, what's it called? So those two are my big influences from outside of film or Marquez and, and Borges. And, you know, I'm, I'm giving you a lot of Latin writers and Latin, you know, Latin writers and stuff, but that's your culture, are, man. I mean, there's yeah, nothing, you know, and obviously I'm going to touch on that because that's a super important part of your film, yeah. especially the new one that is coming up because yeah. it is based on, um, a so-called crisis that, mm -hmm. you know, may or may not exist according to some people. Um, but, but yeah. it could exist coming soon. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It could be an issue yeah. for many of people. Um, so I don't want I don't want to spoil anything because I wanted to hear it from your mouth, of course. Yeah. Because yeah. it is your film. It is not mine. This is just I am the host. I am the the uh driver, if you will, of this whole thing. Yeah. You're my Uber <laughs> driver. Uh, well, I gotta be an Uber driver. <laughs> so I can't yeah, just be man. I can't be regular driving like you gotta, you gotta Uber drive. Hi, your Uber is here. Oh my god! <laughs> so <laughs> my uh, so I'll tell you my favorite film out of all three of yours that are out now because I'm sure you want to know. You want my opinion, and I do yeah. love and I love Bloodline, and I yeah. the reason why I love it is because some of the shots in in that thing where you're you have an overlay of you talking. And it's showing, I don't know if it is, is it your home to like near your hometown of Texas? Cause I know you, you talk about your, your grandfather, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, and how he came over with literally nothing and had to yeah. make something out of nothing. And, mm -hmm. um, I, if I don't want to get this wrong, but was that the, the farmland that he purchased? Or am I? All those shots are are, are the property. Uh, that documentary holds the, the all those shots were here on the property. Uh, when he came over, he was one of the first people to settle in this land. Okay, so he he is a pioneer. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so that's definitely yeah, interesting. That definitely opens up a lot. You know, as far as like you see these kind of shots, and you're like, well, he's somewhere you know, down South there's mm -hmm. desert, but there's also some life out there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but you showed us, you showed us the gate, you know, mm -hmm. and how, how yeah. much weight that holds to a lot of people. It's mm -hmm. basically like a fuck you. You can't come in mm -hmm. like you have to. And now it's harder than ever, you know, not, not mm -hmm. when back then where they when you can just get in, you know, and they would let you yeah. in. Um, so yeah. it definitely it definitely bared some weight for me. I was I was watching it. I was very intrigued because I've actually never been to Texas. So I don't mm -hmm. know anything about this. The border crisis that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know anything about that whole situation. You know, I do have friends yeah. that definitely are illegal immigrants. Uh, and before I we get into this whole, you know, Latino part and your culture part of it and what part that plays in your films, um, I just want to say fuck ICE 
Fuck those yeah. people. Fuck anybody who really believes in that shit. I think it's trash, and that that's yeah. my opinion. Yeah, my, my my beliefs go really deeper into that, and I'll be glad to get into that. Uh, it's um, what's it called? This land here. It's uh, it's you know that the only shot that's not on my property on the property is the is the establishing shot that's outside of the street. You know, it's just driving a little bit past the street. It's that farmland. And, uh, we, it's, it, it, it's incredible, man. This little, this part out here is, it's, 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 it's beautiful, but at the same time, it's, this is also where kind of border patrol is, 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 uh, is here all the time. And it's, it's, uh, it's crazy, man. It's, um, what's it called? I really liked shooting that movie. I did that. I wrote that movie about the day before I shot it and I shot that one in a day. And then I edited in two days. So this was a quick process. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was all on me. Right. No actors, no nothing. Yeah. You were just, well, I mean, you technically had people in there, but yeah, you, yeah. You had to, yeah. I'm assuming you probably had to pull, you had to pull their leg to get in there. Right. I'm assuming. Cause it's, you know, filming your family is probably the mm. toughest thing you could ever do. The, the actually the only one who gave me trouble was my little brother. My my aunt was really into it. She was like, "Yeah, of course I'll tell my story." I'm very surprised because when I did a similar film like that, um, mm-hmm. I had an advanced post production class that I had to take for my minor, and it was yeah. it was a very similar film about uh, family stories and all that sort of mm-hmm. stuff. So my family story is not exactly. Um, the craziest thing, it just kind of happened. <laughs> you know, as I had to make it interesting by by putting in elements of things that happened to us, you know, and especially me being uh, uh, half black, half white, um, mm-hmm. you know, going through hardships as far as that goes. Uh, mm-hmm. And my parents, the hardships that they faced in the mid 90s um, mm-hmm. before it was widely accepted like it is now in the, uh, the new millennium. Mm-hmm. But. I definitely resonated with that because I made a similar film and I was like, I was like, damn, this is, this is actually a lot of interesting content and the shots were really good. I really enjoyed it. Like I loved seeing the scenery down there cause I've never seen it. So I don't know what it looks like. You know, we, there's a lot of people that talk a lot of stuff about this border thing and what it looks like down there, but they don't have a fucking clue. They'd never been. Yeah. Down there. There's a lot of people that talk about things they don't know. Some and people actually think educated. that there's not a gate. Yeah. <laughs> Some people actually think that there's not a gate, but there is. It's like right there, man. <laughs> it's like, dude, it's right there, brother. Like, just look at it. <laughs> yeah, no. Yep. So I find it interesting that you look a lot like your brother. Is that your brother, Eric? I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah my you youngest. guys, you guys, you guys look very similar. And I was yeah. like, I was like, wait, is that him? But he he wants to be an actor. Yeah. Right? That's yes. crazy. So we got a director and an actor in one. And then family. my big brother's a writer. And your brother's a writer. Dude. Yeah. My you big know, brother's the one who started uh we started our production company, Cyclops Films. And yeah. uh he's the he, we both write. Uh, so he didn't really write beyond the he did uh produce it because he did some revisions on it. But the next script we'll be doing, that's completely uh, written by him and me. That's very that's very interesting. You know, keep it in the family. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's cool as fuck. And I'm the Alabama way. Yeah, well, let's... let's. <laughs> <laughs> Yeehaw, brother, K-Kona. Uh, <laughs> you will only understand that if you're on Twitch, but <laughs> you, you know what I mean. <laughs> Okay, so uh, going back, uh, I really love yeah. Bloodline. I think it's an amazing uh, story. Um, Thank and you. And I'm glad you put the subtitles because, mm-hmm. God, I would not be able to know what your aunt was saying. I didn't even know who that was, to be honest. So thank you for telling me that was your aunt. I was trying to figure mm-hmm. out – I was trying to, like, make a deduction. And she probably said it, mm-hmm. and I was probably loosely paying attention. I was definitely listening to it more than I was looking at it because it was just kind of a mm-hmm. – a shot that was just a still almost of just mm-hmm. her sitting there and telling the story, which is what I was mm-hmm. thinking about, you know, just kind of, 
you know, and I don't, I don't understand Spanish. So I was kind of like looking back and forth. I was doing like two things at once and I'm like, I'm like, all right, okay. So something mm-hmm. about farm and working on it and doing all that. And I'm like, all right, cool. Like, that's interesting. Like, I definitely didn't know that about you because, you know, we don't talk a ton. We don't really go mm-hmm. into the backstory of things, you know, unless we, you know, interview each other on these podcasts. So that's the coolest part about it. I love yeah. getting to know more about the people around me. I think that's super mm-hmm. important that people know that because then they can come in references. So when you're a big fucking star and I'm fucking doing nothing, <laughs> I could be like, bro, I interviewed you. You remember me? <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> we're all going to make it big because we're all fucking working yeah. hard, you know. And I yeah, referenced yeah. this in the half episode and I said, there's a lot of, you know, boomer era people and the people who came after boomers that don't think we do a, nothing, that we do nothing, that we just sit around yeah. and just fuck around all day. Like we're not doing anything, mm-hmm. but we're fucking out here hustling, doing things that you actually mm-hmm. want to do. Because we have the Mm -hmm. opportunity to, like, the internet is so powerful that we have it in our grasp pretty much to do what we want. People are getting paid to do fake pranks on the internet. People are getting paid to literally play video games, you know? Yeah. And we're going to get paid to do what we want because that's what we do. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Uh, I also feel like, you know, back then, you know, what's it called? Becoming a big band or a big musician or you know, a big uh, director and all that, you know, it was, a, it was, it was, uh, it wasn't as widely uh, shown because you didn't have social media. Now, you know how much people struggle to get their content out back then. I'm pretty sure there was 20 million people who wanted to be as big, uh, 20 people, 20,000 people. However, like there were a lot of people who wanted to be as big as Stanley Kubrick and Alfred Hitchcock, but they never got there because they didn't have the exposure that these two had. And, you know, it's a, uh, it, but ch- times were different back then and just now because of the internet we have more access to that we actually see how people struggle now now we can see everything which is mm-hmm. great because now we know what it takes and what it mm-hmm. what it can do it could be one thing or it could be a million like you just get lucky mm-hmm. or you just make something so you plan out so much stuff yeah and you get it right the one time and you blow up like mm-hmm. sometimes it happens like that some people were planted in the spots that they're planted. It happens. Like, you just kind of got to go around it. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep, so, I agree, man. So, one thing I want to talk about, and I was kind of getting to this, um, how does the Latino culture influence your film? I mean, being Latino is everything to me, man. You know, um, it's, 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 it, culture is everything to me, man. And what's it called? Uh, I'm very proud to be the person that I am. I'm As proud to be Latino. Yeah, I'm proud to be Latino. You know, I, I say it a lot on Twitter and I say it a lot on Instagram and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I really, I, I don't care, you know, if it makes people uncomfortable or not, man. Like, I, I'll scream from the rooftops. I am proud to be Latino, man. You know, I'm proud of where my parents came from. I'm proud of where my grandma came from. Proud, You know, I'm proud that my descendants are, you know, uh, from, 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 from the, great, uh, the great region of Latin America. And I, I love that. And it's everything to me. Uh, you know, my my stories center around that identity, but they also sometimes center around things that are talked about a lot in the Latino community. You know, you have the idea of death. And because we're so tied to our indigenous roots, the idea of death is very different in the indigenous communities than it is with uh, with the stereocentric view of it all. And, uh, you know, I, 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 there's just so much that I could go on about, about why it, it relates to my films, but identity is such a big thing to me, especially where I live, you know, you know, we're the majority out here and it's also very different in the way, cause you know, we're not, it's not, we're not, we're in the middle of two countries and we're, you know, creating our own culture here, but at the same time, it's a lot like both the other cultures that are kind of mixing. It's it's a beautiful blend. It's 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 unlike any other area in the United States, unless you live near the border. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That I mean, and obviously being from you know a border style town, obviously influenced it a lot. You can tell mm-hmm. definitely in uh, bloodline because obviously that's about your family. So mm-hmm. beyond the river coming out in twenty nineteen. Is actually about um, a mix of those things that we just mentioned, 
Mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit more? All right. Yeah. Beyond the River is my next short film. And what's it called? It, it is a story about a young couple, Jose and Jessica, who have 24 hours to spend together before they are um, separated because a law would be closing down the border. And one of them lives in Bronzo and one of them lives in Matamoros. So I dive into the idea of loss, separation, love, and I very much got this idea from a tweet from our president uh, months ago. Uh, he had said that, you know, if Mexico would not comply with, you know, stopping the flow of immigrants, that he would look into closing the border. So I started looking into the idea of like, what about like the idea of separation? Because, you know, not everybody can relate to the idea of, of, of a mother separated from a child because not everybody's a parent. But right. everybody has felt something for someone. And if that love would ever be separated from you in without you having a say in it, it, it it's something I really wanted to explore. That emotional and physical separation. It's a great idea, let me tell you. I absolutely mm. love it. I can't I can't wait to watch it. I can't wait till it's out. I'm gonna be blasting the shit out of that. I'm just so yeah, excited. Thanks, man. I'm so excited to see it because it's it's a very telling situation of our our time right now especially mm -hmm. in america where um we don't know what's gonna happen we don't know mm -hmm. what could happen something bad could happen in an instant or something like mm -hmm. that can happen immediately it's happening mm -hmm. now at the border where people are getting separated from uh mm -hmm. mothers and children you know people that they love and things are happening down there that aren't american to me Mm -hmm. It doesn't, yeah. it's not American at all. I don't think people understand that. I think yeah. that if we did the same thing to people, they would definitely yeah. understand. And this is not obviously not the first instance of separating people in American history, which yeah. a lot of people don't like to reference World War II when uh, yeah. Japanese Ooh. and Asian immigrants were separated from families. Mm -hmm. and and I will go, I can even go farther back from that, man. Uh, Operation Webback during the Great that, Depression. Mm -hmm. After the Great Depression, uh, Mexican what's it called Latino immigrants blamed a lot for the blame for the Great Depression. So what's it called? Uh, Operation Webback saw the mass deportation of non citizens and citizens. You know there were people that were um, that were sent back that were citizens in this country, and uh, it's it's you know we go you go farther than that, man. I mean, what's it called at the it's, end of the U.S. Mexico War? You know we goes were made all the way back. From, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I mean, this land is stolen, man. It's it's stolen land. Yeah. And the funny thing is the border we have right now, that's not even the border. On the uh, on the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, it says that the border is actually the Nueces River by San Antonio. Right. Mm -hmm. So where where is... Okay, so I obviously I don't know geography and I don't have a map, but where yeah. is San Antonio relative to where you are so where you're you said you're located by houston texas correct no man okay. i'm deep down in oh, the, so the you're tip. farther down okay yeah but you go yeah, to the so, university of houston okay so that's yeah excuse me so you're mm -hmm. all the way down there but where is san antonio oh. relative to you it's four hours north of me so Ooh. you know what's it called it's so it's it's a big chunk of area that would actually be the actual border but, I mean, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was, it was a forced treaty, and it was also a treaty that was never complied by the treaty. Right. The U.S. Yeah. never complied by it. They never complied yeah. by anything. It's yeah, government. and that's why we have so much land grant issues with a land that was in dispersed, correct? Yeah. So, whew, that's, a, that's a whole yeah. lot, man. It's, it's just rough yeah. down there, and I love the fact that you're, your film explores the idea of this separation, you know, and mm -hmm. you, you do, you said you have a lot of themes according to you like to explore love and, you know, um, mm -hmm. emotion, especially mm -hmm. with you being inspired by, um, is it Neo French? Did I say that? Uh, right? Neo realism. Neo realism. Italian neo realism. Yeah. Yeah. So French neo realism and stuff like that of like, mm -hmm you know, exploring that emotion. So 
obviously there's other influences to that, you know, one being your culture, but how does it feel being a person of color and making these films, you know, in a world that's yeah. dominated by bald white guys? Yeah. I mean, first of all, I wouldn't even consider myself, you know, a person of color, you know, that's not my position to, to, to call myself that, you know, I'm right. very white passing, but I feel like it is my duty to represent my community because nobody else is doing it. And, you know, the voices that are trying to do it aren't getting the that the majority is getting. But, you know, it, for me, it's the idea of that these stories are being ignored and I need to tell them. And that's why I really wanted to do this one and why my, you know, I surrounded myself with a team that was very diverse or well, not very, you know, we had, we had women, and we have uh, in the crew, we have in the cast, we have women, you know, but we also don't have light Latinos. We had, you know, what's it called? Darker skinned Latinos. And, you know, I, I really wanted to push the idea. You know, Brad asked me yesterday, he's like, is this a political stance? And I'm like, it's, 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 it's not. It shouldn't be a political stance. It shouldn't be a political stance to want to stay with the person that you love. It should, you know? It's a human rights thing. It's a human thing. It's a humane yeah. thing. It's something that all of us humans want. It's to love whoever we want to love. So, you know, what's it called? It, it, it's very much, you know, I want to tell my story. I need to tell my story. And this is the way I'm going to tell it. You know, I, I, I love any artist from my community, whether it's, you know, you know, actual like, you know, paintings and stuff like that, or if it's literature or if it's music, because they're, they're telling their story. And I feel like that's very important. Right. So one thing I, I want to ask you and, with all three of your films being different and the one that we haven't seen yet, and I'm assuming it's on a different standpoint than your other ones that you've made in the past. Mm -hmm. One thing I, that people talk about when they review film and especially being uh, film shots or, or anything like that, or film score. Uh, one thing that I want to ask you is how important are color, uh, a soundtrack, or any other elements like what do you what do you think is the most important element especially like when you making film uh versus you watching film or what do you think is super important honestly man i think it's the two aspects you just told me about right now you know Color first and of all soundtrack. your score can make or break your scene yes 100%. like you know a perfect example i heard in a podcast you go back to E.T. and you see that part where, you know, the where, where E.T. is leaving. If you didn't have that amazing score from John Williams, John Williams, John Williams, you know, what's it called? It wouldn't feel the same. And, yeah, you right. know, that's even though I'm not musically sound and I don't use music at the moment because I haven't found the right person to help me out with a score. It's something that I pay a lot of attention to. And then color, color really sets your atmosphere and the tone of your film. Uh, you know, there's a lot of movies out there, big budgets that have like separate tones. Like it feels like there's a different tone throughout the movies. And it's because that sometimes it doesn't feel like your, your look is the same as it should be. So, you know, if you have one tone going throughout the film, it's, it's influenced by a lot of things. It's influenced by your music. It's influenced by your color, by the angles you choose and by the direction. And for to me, honestly, the two biggest components of that are the score and the and the coloring of the film. And coloring is actually the only thing that I enjoy doing in editing. I don't like editing, but coloring is my favorite thing to do in editing. Okay, so um, re re going back to that question. So is that your favorite part of other people's films too, or do you think mm -hmm. they, that other people have something else that kind of drives that? So, um, mm -hmm. there's, so what I've noticed, at least what I've noticed is, um, bloodline. I keep on referencing that because I, yeah, I no really like it. it, um, mm -hmm. has a color. You can tell it's that mm -hmm. it's kind of, um, you know, brown. It's a very, it's a very mm -hmm. brown kind of I'm orange mm -hmm. color. I mean, it, I mean, it makes sense and you know, you can definitely tell <laughs> that it was kind of color corrected. Um, mm -hmm. to kind of feel a certain way, kind of like a, um, I don't know how to describe it, but it's like a burnt orange and blue mix, if that makes any yeah. sense. It, um, it's kind of the color of an old picture that you're seeing of your family. Right, yeah. 
So that's sepia. what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's what I wanted I'm to achieve. For. And I wanted to have the vegetation pop a little bit. Right, yeah. Sepia is, is an important, uh, especially, well, at least in photography, you know, mm -hmm. sepia, black and white. And then, you know, obviously mm -hmm. people do the crazy, like, neon now. Neon is super yeah. in right now. Yeah, I don't really like that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's all right, but yeah. um, one thing... I think it's overly saturated, thing, man. Yeah, very true. It is It is very oversaturated. Kind of like everything mm -hmm. in life, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what what can we kind of expect from the color? That is there a soundtrack to this movie? Like I said, you said you you didn't really do anything as far as, as music, yeah, but what can we expect to see... Um, shots wise, color wise, from you yeah. on Beyond the River. Um, so yeah, it doesn't have a comp it doesn't have a score, but I'll be using music from the internet and stuff like that. So there will be music to accompany the film. Um, shot wise, I did a lot. Like you know, I did a lot of really good uh, close ups, but you know, I kind of had with this one. This is also my sh the the you know the film with the most you know room to breathe. Honestly, I didn't want to make this one as a tight feeling to it as the other ones. But uh, what's it called? Color-wise, actually, I haven't really... That's This is the film I'm not coloring. That's all up to my editor. But there, there, I am going to be overseeing that part. That's the only part I want to oversee. Right. And, uh, yeah, I want to give it a feel of, you know, kind of like bloodlines, but mixed a little bit with the feeling of immortal. That kind of very pop, you know, that where the colors really popped. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're you're just going for it on this one, man. I'm, I'm yeah. Very, I, I'm a very proud friend to to watch you kind of blossom into what you're doing. Thanks, man. Thanks. It's very cool to see it. Um, one thing I actually didn't ask you, and I meant to ask you, um, at the beginning because I'm sure people want to know, or they don't want to know, or they don't really matter. But how old are you? 22 years old. 22 years old. So you're uh, mm -hmm. two years younger than me. Mm -hmm. And you, you got three films out already. So that's that's a good start. Mm -hmm. And you started late. So you started, what, yeah. in 20, you said 2016, 16. correct? Yeah. So that was three years ago. So you started when you were like, what is that, 19? <laughs> Dude, I couldn't do that. Yeah, 19. <laughs> no, you got it. You got it, man. 19 oh, years so old. so smart, man. <laughs> yeah, I started writing scripts at 19. And I have like f four scripts in the vault that I haven't used. Dude, you you got it made, man. You're ready to go, baby. <laughs> Basically, man. So one thing I wanted to uh, talk about, but I'll ask this question first, is what is the hardest part about being a filmmaker? Yeah, uh, the hardest. That's a really, really good question. The hardest part of filmmaking, honestly, man, is it's actually, you know, the, the hardest part is also the most fun part to me, honestly, the, the part that I enjoy the most, which is conceptualizing your idea, you know, actually building the picture in your head. And making it come to, to sure. fruition and, you know, yeah. making it come to life. Yeah. Creating that vision that I want. Yeah, because some, cause sometimes it's, you think it one way, but you just can't get it. Because not everything can translate on screen the same. Right. Yeah. And one one thing I, I've noticed, especially, um, is it's kind of hard to do things with little to no budget on certain things. Because there's, mm -hmm. you know, you, you'll notice, like, there'll be something and you'll be like, man, I could really see it going this way. And it's just missing mm -hmm. that one CGI thing that you can't do because it costs, mm -hmm. like thousands of dollars that you mm -hmm. don't have or yeah thousands of dollars worth of time you know thousands of minutes thousands of hours or you haven't met the right person yet that can yeah. do it for you that wants to be yeah, that wants to help you so that they can get helped as well yeah so yeah, one, no, one I thing i want to learn to do is uh sound design because i actually took a class uh, an audio production. So I, I had worked on this, this it's called video art. I mean, it's very, it's very avant-garde kind of weird. Well, I, those are my favorites and it's called disease. And I mm -hmm. had made it with like 
no nothing in mind. I had I had this art book that I had and they talked about video art and like um mm-hmm. displays and and you know sets and it would film mm-hmm. like the set and it was just kind of weird and kind of all over the place. So I decided that I wanted to do that. And one thing I kind of fell in love with is how sounds are made. So yeah. Foley is one thing that's mm-hmm. really cool that I actually got to do uh, for one mm-hmm. of my audio production classes. And um, <laughs> it's a very interesting, like, like whole experience, like watching a Foley being done. They just grab mm-hmm. these random ass objects and like things that you don't expect to be like a, what it is, is what it is. Like there is a video of a Foley from a Mortal Kombat game. And yeah. obviously being Mortal Kombat, which is a, a gruesome game, people getting cut up and shit and dying pretty much. Mm-hmm. You, you would think like, Oh, like, well, how do they make the sounds for this game? Like, mm-hmm. especially cause you can't just go and kill someone and get the sound. Like you, <laughs> you're going to have to have a lot of volunteers to get it right. You know what yeah. I mean? Like breaking bones and, and doing all of that. So I'm like, I'm like, huh. So they, they actually made a video that was a, it was a secret video you had to unlock in one of the games. Um, and they did the Foley work for it. And basically, mm-hmm. it's funny how dropping a turkey off of a parking garage sounds like someone's skull getting crushed. Yeah. Or um breaking breaking celery. Yeah. Uh sounds like a punch. Yeah. Sounds like a punch or a, or breaking an arm. Um, on killing you, I did a little bit of beer. Uh, I actually did an actual punch with my hands to, yes, to mimic I did hear the sound that. of the punch. Mm-hmm. I did hear that. Yeah. That was, that was cool. So one thing I want to do is I want to design sound, but mm-hmm. like ambient noise. Mm-hmm. For something. Yeah. So I, that's one thing that I, I like, I want to like, obviously learn more things. But that comes with like taking the time to actually do them, you know, and finding yeah. that. No, yeah, man. I mean, if you really want to learn it, you you can do it. You get to get the time, man. But it sound design is really cool. Like I, that's an aspect that I really like as well. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and let you in on something. It, it didn't make the cut, but what's it called? I had planned for the ending of the film, the the credits. I was actually gonna just do audio of him walking back to his car. So all you heard was the footsteps, him opening the door, sitting down on the seat, you know, turning his car back on and then a little bit of gripping the wheel and he would leave and then he would release a big like breath and that's where it would finish with the credits. That did not make the cut. Why did you cut it? Was it just a lot of work or, um, you know? I'm, mm-hmm, my directing style I give a lot of freedom to my actors and my crew. I mean, at one point, my AD was directing. And uh, the way that I saw my my crew, my cast, do the ending, it, it sold it for me. I was like, no, that's it. That's that's what I want to do. That's the ending. I That's the ending I want. Okay, so it was and, just uh, something way better that happened that was like, yeah. oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, something better happened. And... I, I really liked what they did with that ending. So I said, you know what? This is a good part to stop. Like you said, it comes out uh, sometime in July or August. So be on the lookout mm-hmm. for that. You guys can also look at my Twitter, twitter.com forward slash S-R-R-K-K Twitch or the YouTube channel. I will definitely have a link to that as well. So um, thank you, man. Thank make you. sure you guys are on the lookout for that. So one last, I have two last questions, and then I have something called the quick hits that I want to do. All right, man. And it's a short session of rapid fire questions. So I actually did not know you were visually impaired. Oh, yeah. That's a big part of my identity as well. So where does that come into play? Yeah, that's going to come into play with my next script. Okay, so it's it's a future thing, but. That's something I haven't touched. Okay, so does it become difficult for you to make films because you're visually impaired? So, so what what exactly 
what how how are you visually impaired i should say that's probably a better way to phrase that yeah like you know i just like i have really bad uh you know vision i i really use bad a vision. Cane. yeah i use the cane to get around sometimes and uh you know i'm it, it's hard sometimes to get what i want for my shots but i visualize them so well in my head from what i'm able to see i'm able to create from there yeah, so that's no, it's no excuse. Like you can do what you got. to Yeah, do. it's no excuse to me. I mean, I'm, I'm still able to go to work. I'm still able to do a lot of things, man. It's not, it's not an excuse for me. I have accommodations that help me, you know, do the work that I need to do. But you know, I don't let it get in the way. Dude, I'm, I'm glad, man. That's all that matters. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so here is my stick on the quick hits, baby. We're gonna do it mm-hmm. fast and quick. And then I'm going to close this out. And one thing I want to say is thank you guys all for listening. If you got this far, I hope you learned a lot from Mr. Alejandro Mendoza or the nerdy Chicano, the man, the myth, the legend. So this is the quick hits fast, quick, easy, baby. So what's your favorite film? A uh, beautiful 2010 best scene in a movie ever. Uh, the opening shot to Godfather 1972 favorite film score composer. Hans Zimmer. Which meme would you rather have in your movie? Michael Bay explosions or M. Night Shyamalan twists? M. M Night Shyamalan twists. What is your favorite guilty pleasure film? I don't believe in guilty pleasures. I like what I like. The worst movie you've ever watched? Venom 2018. That's a recent one. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It was that bad? Fucking terrible. (laughs) Oh shit. Uh your favorite color to put in the film? It's a mix between blue and brown. And last one, describe yourself in one movie. Oh. Damn. One movie. Wait, like one movie to describe who I am? Yeah, just to describe your life. Oh crap. I don't think there has been a movie made about my life yet. Well, I mean, <laughs> anything yeah, anything I, come I, close <laughs> that's a really really good question man uh maybe um maybe under the same moon the idea of being lost in a territory that you may not know completely okay that's it that's the quick hits so i'm gonna leave you guys here last question what's in the future for you there is more movies, there is more podcasts, there is more photos, but right now what I need you guys to do the most is to just be on the lookout for Beyond the River. Drops the last week of July or the first week of August, I'll let you guys know about that. Please go watch that on my YouTube channel, and uh, after that I'm going, to, I'm going to work on, after that goes up, then my next documentary, Borderlands, will be going up. That is about my the area that I'm from, and after that, I'm taking a solid break from documentary filmmaking, and I'm going to be pushing more narrative based. Uh, what's it called? Narrative based short films, and uh, yeah, make sure you keep an eye on that, man. It's a uh, the podcast as always. It's popping in there, you know. Go and listen to that. That's my it's my forte. It's my it's one of my passions as well. But it's my love. Uh, what's it called? My my deepest passion. My love for filmmaking. But uh, also, you know, stuff in the in the future. You know, what's it called? Um, be on the lookout for just to come and talk to me, man. Uh, you know, I may look like, I may sound like a pretentious film film buff, but like, I, I truly want to talk to movies about you guys. You know, the, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of these superhero movies that come out, like major blockbuster stuff, but, you know, I have opinions on them and I want to talk about them with you guys. So you guys should go out and be on the lookout for that and talk to me and, and uh, talk to me about movies. I'll never berate you for your opinion on film. Never. Awesome. Unless you like Venom. Unless you like Venom. <laughs> yeah, Venom was terrible. I kind of want to watch it now to see. Yeah. I, although I don't really like superhero movies, it kind of got me interested. I was like, damn, is it really that yeah. garbage? Yeah, I mean, just the dialogue is terrible. It feels like it's two different movies in one. I mean, could I go on, man? It, it, it felt like, you know, the most rushed pacing I've ever seen in a movie. Yeah. And, uh, you know, before I leave, I want to say something out there, especially to uh, to mi gente. 
we are pushing something more special than you guys could ever understand our community it is we are flourishing in music right now the land trap movement is in is amazing so if you're latino and you want to pick up a camera please do it man please write your script do what you want to do tell your story because them right now out there right now they they don't want to tell our stories they don't want to do it so we have to be the ones to tell them so por favor mi gente hay que hacer la arte hay que ser Gente que quiere decir nuestras historias. So please, go and do that, guys. And, um, you know, we, we, we have such rich history. You know, we our indigenous ancestors had such rich history as well. So go and do that. Make art, my, my people, please. It, it is truly one of the greatest things that we could do. Fuck yeah, I fuck with it. So I want to thank you guys for listening or watching. If you're on YouTube, we appreciate you so much. You can find Raul Alejandro Mendoza on Twitter and Instagram at the Nerdy Chicano. There it is. And I'll see you guys in the next episode. Don't have anyone planned yet because I'm terrible at this thing. (laughs) Hell yeah, brother. We'll see you next time. Thank you guys so much for listening and or watching. I do appreciate all the support and I hope uh, to see you in the next one. Peace. Peace.